If you tell me you're seeing flashes of light in your vision, these are the things that are going through my head. This video does not replace an eye exam. My hopes with providing you with this information are that it may help guide you to better prepare you for that examination with your doctor. By knowing the symptoms and which eye it's occurring in, the frequency of the symptoms and other related details, it can help your doctor reach a diagnosis faster and get you the treatment that you need. If you come in telling me you're seeing flashes of light, here are a few questions that I'm going to be asking you right away. Is it in one eye or both? What do they look like and how long do they last? How long between episodes or how frequently are they occurring? Are there any other symptoms that happened around the same time? What were you doing when the symptoms started? Could there have been a possibility for trauma? All of these questions can help us better understand what's going on and really help to lead us to the right diagnosis. As an eye doctor, when it comes to flashes, the first big five that come to mind are posterior vitreous detachments, retinal breaks, retinal detachments, ocular migraines, and migraine with aura. The first three might be difficult or impossible to distinguish from one another because they share the same main symptoms. Posterior vitreous detachments, retinal breaks, and retinal detachments all share the symptoms of flashes and floaters and sometimes blurry vision. Floaters can look like squiggly lines, dots, or cobwebs that move with eye movement and are usually more noticeable against a bright background. The condition could be in both eyes, but it would be pretty unusual for the symptoms to start simultaneously in both eyes unless there was some sort of trauma involved. Sometimes these conditions happen spontaneously, and I've even seen it when someone takes a slightly rough step off a curb. Posterior vitreous detachments. As we age, the vitreous gel that fills the eye that helps it to hold its shape becomes a little less jelly and a little more liquidy. Though this is a normal part of the aging process, it can lead to the vitreous detaching from the retina. Normally, the back of the vitreous has tight attachment points to areas of the retina, particularly the optic nerve, the blood vessels, and the peripheral retina. That's why you have to make sure when a posterior vitreous detachment occurs that it didn't pull any of the retina along with it, causing a retinal break or a retinal detachment as the vitreous was detaching. Posterior vitreous detachments can cause flashes because the retina does get tugged on usually as it's detaching from it. But these tend to become less frequent over time once the vitreous has fully detached they also tend to cause a lot of new floaters in the vision. Now, a lot of us have floaters that we've had most of our lives that we recognize, but this would be a sudden onset of a bunch of new floaters and sometimes really big ones. One thing that might separate a posterior vitreous detachment apart from the other two retinal breaks or retinal detachments are a large circular floater potentially towards the center of the vision. And this happens because one of those tight attachment points, which is the optic nerve, is circular in shape. So when the vitreous detaches from there, sometimes it can leave a perfect circular floater in the vision, but this doesn't happen in everyone. Even if the diagnosis is a posterior vitreous detachment without any retinal complications, your doctor will still probably want to follow up in a few weeks to months to make sure everything stays stable. That's because the posterior vitreous may still be in the process of detaching and it may still have the opportunity to cause a tear or a detachment of the retina during this process. It's just really hard to tell the status of the vitreous because it's a clear gel. Retinal breaks are when a hole or tear develops in the retina, usually in the periphery. A few things that might increase the risk of this happening are high myopia or nearsightedness, a personal or family history of a retinal break or detachment, a history of cataract surgery, or trauma. The symptoms can be identical to those of a posterior vitreous detachment. You might even see that circular-like floater, though usually for these it'd probably be in the periphery if that was the case. But that makes getting an eye exam all the more important because while a posterior vitreous detachment is usually no big deal, a retinal tear or hole usually needs to be treated within 24 to 72 hours to avoid 
progression to a retinal detachment, which could lead to severe vision loss. Retinal detachments are when fluid travels through a retinal break and gets behind the retina, causing it to detach from the back of the eye. Along with the mainstays of flashes and floaters, there are some additional symptoms that can help to differentiate it from a posterior vitreous detachment or a retinal break. And these would be the appearance of a curtain closing over the vision or a shadow in the vision, or sometimes the appearance of water in a certain area of the vision. They can especially affect central vision, causing it to be very blurry if the retinal detachment extends to the macula, which is responsible for central vision. Retinal detachments often need to be treated within 24 hours, and that's especially if the macula is still on because we don't want the detachment to extend to include the macula and affect that central vision. Ocular migraines and migraines with aura can appear to be kind of similar, but they're not the same. They can also look similar to the other retinal conditions we've been talking about, or they could drastically differ. And that's because the symptoms might just be flashes of light or peripheral vision changes, or zigzags and rainbows. Both ocular migraines and migraines with aura tend to have typical triggers. This is where keeping track of your history can really help you and your doctor reach a diagnosis and treatment plan. Having a log of how you were feeling, what you were doing, what happened right before the migraine started, along with your recent health history can really help in this process. It can help you identify if it's something as simple as a bright light flashing in the periphery, or it might remind you to mention something that you might normally overlook, like a recent change in birth control, which can really affect your hormones, and that can be a trigger for migraines. Ocular migraines are often managed just by avoiding the triggers rather than by treating them medically. So understanding your history and triggers can really help the doctor help you more efficiently. Common triggers of either type of migraine are dehydration, poor sleep, physical exertion, bright or flickering lights, strong odors, loud noises, certain foods like chocolate, alcohol, caffeine, MSG, and aged cheeses or processed meats. Now that is a lot of triggers. Let's talk about the differences between ocular migraines and migraine with aura. Ocular migraines happen in one eye at a time and are believed to be caused by vascular changes in the retina or optic nerve. Therefore, they only happen in that one eye at a time. While in migraine with aura, visual experiences are happening in both eyes because the changes are going on in the brain, including where vision is processed. Ocular migraines usually happen for about 20 minutes on average, whereas the aura portion of a migraine typically lasts between 20 and 60 minutes. Both may occur with or without a headache, but headaches are more likely in the migraine with aura and they tend to last longer. Additionally, migraines with aura may be accompanied by other neurological symptoms like numbness or tingling or language or motor disturbances. Being able to differentiate between the two may help when determining a treatment plan whether that's to simply avoid triggers and wait it out when it happens, or to treat with medications or procedures. It's also important to know and share with your doctor if there's a family or personal history of migraines. If this is happening out of the blue, it may necessitate a visit with a neurologist, and a visit with a neurologist would probably be a good idea anyway. Some other interesting causes of flashes that your doctor will probably rule out with a quick conversation about your symptoms are phosphenes, which happen when you press on the eye, or Moore's lightning streaks, which happen with rapid eye movement in a dark room. And I have a video talking all about that, but be sure to finish watching this one first. Also, there are intraocular lens dysphotopsias, which would apply to people who have had cataract surgery with a lens implant. These can look like glare, halos, or starbursts because of the way that light hits the intraocular lens implant. All of these conditions I've been discussing, I would guess would include 99% or more of the causes of flashes of light. But there are other conditions that based on your eye exam and history, may be looked into further with additional testing or evaluations by other specialists. And these could include central nervous system disorders, drug-related causes, optic neuropathies, vertebrobacillar artery insufficiency, retinitis or uveitis, which is inflammation in the eye, 
or people can sometimes experience flashes after laser retinal procedures. There are also visual hallucinations, whether it's due to an underlying psychological condition or due to something that can happen in those with severe vision loss, Charles Bonnet syndrome. Are you experiencing flashes? As you've seen, flashes of light can have many underlying causes, some of which need to be treated immediately. The only way to know for sure is to have a dilated eye exam, so please don't hesitate to get checked out. Click here to learn more about strange visual phenomena. There are some mind-blowing things that happen in the eyes and visual processing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.